Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast, brought to you by Mayo Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Andrea Tooley. And I'm Dr. Eric Bothan. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest in ophthalmology, medicine, and more. In today's episode, we sit down with Dr. Keith Barretts, cornea specialist at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Barretts is known nationally and internationally for his work on the genetic and molecular markers of Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy. Today, Dr. Barretts takes us through his work on Fuchs and how his research translates into clinical care, novel therapeutics, and new approaches for surgery, even for the comprehensive ophthalmologist. Dr. Keith Barretts is a professor of ophthalmology and a corneal specialist here at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Barretts has served on the board of directors for the American Board of Ophthalmology, as well as the editorial board for JAMA Ophthalmology and more. He is a past recipient of the AAO Achievement Award. Dr. Barretts' clinical practice focuses on the medical and surgical treatment of cornea and external diseases, corneal transplantation, and cataract surgery. He he has a specific interest in Fuchs corneal dystrophy and genetic causes and biochemical mechanisms of this disease. Welcome, Dr. Barretts. Well, thanks. Great to be here to talk about my favorite topic. Tell us about that. How did you start to get interest in Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy? Well, we have a lot of Fuchs here in Minnesota, at Mayo Clinic, so I've always taken care of lots of patients with, with the condition. However, it all really started with a knock on the door, Um, and this was in about 2006. 2006, I was doing research, some epidemiology, some some clinical things, but I really didn't have a genetic focus, actually not even a genetic interest. I realized one of those people who who knew basics about homozygous homozygous versus heterozygous, but not much more. And I actually got a knock on the door one day by Al Edwards, who was a former research colleague here, and is a brilliant, brilliant fella with a lot of foresight. And he knocked on the door and says, Keith, uh, is there a, a corny condition that we should look into genetics? And it was like, duh, the answer is Fuchs. Now there's already another multi-center trial getting started to look at the, the genetics of Fuchs. And I thought, well, and there's this other study, why, you know, why should we embark on it? Uh, but Al, Al said we th- he thought it was doable. And the, the goal was to, to work towards a GWAS, which is a genome-wide association study. And a GWAS typically relies on thousands of patients uh, to, to compare two, two groups. So GWAS are usually really large studies. And just to step back with the GWAS, is it's, it's, you're looking at the normal variation in nucleotides across the entire genome, across all your chromosomes. And large GWAS studies now are, are looking at really hundreds of thousands to a million different loci in the gene and, and typing the variations. And what you're doing is you're comparing two groups of patients, the control group and the group with the disease, and statistically separating them and identifying points in the genome where those two groups are most dissimilar. Mm-hmm. So it's a way of just pinpointing towards a locus in the gene. It doesn't identify a genetic defect. It doesn't identify exactly where, where the, the defect or mutation may be. But it tells you where in the gene those two groups are most dissimilar. And Al l- looked at Fuchs. He said, this is really a gene or a disease that sh- we should be able to pinpoint just one or two or a couple of genes. GWAS are really good for complex genetic traits like myopia. There may be, who knows how many genes, but lots of genes that all contribute. Glaucoma, lots of genes may be contributing, uh, keratoconus, and, and many other things such as, you know, just your, 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 uh, you know, your mentality, your personality, you know, all these things are probably genetic causes, very, very complex, and environmental factors as well. Uh, but Al, Al thought that there, we should be able to find just a couple of genes uh, for Fuchs because of the, the nature of the condition. And darn if he wasn't right. We, we recruited a total of, I think, 230 patients with Fuchs, which is a very small study. Mm-hmm. And we got a very, very strong hit at the transcription factor for gene. So I love stories about serendipitous moments Mm -hmm. in medicine and I feel like we all have those things in our career where we've been led different places or a research door has been opened or a project that you didn't even think about but you alluded to the fact that you had already kind of 
thought there was a genetic mm-hmm. basis. You said you see a lot of Fuchs patients in Minnesota. So mm-hmm. do you think it's because there's a there's a population based uh, incidence of higher in kind of Minnesotans are are kind of Norwegian patient population, or yes. you've seen it in families, or what were you? Mm-hmm. Did you have an inkling before? Mm-hmm. Well, well, a couple things. Uh, number one, there was a large family study by Jay Kratchmer in the 1970s, okay. and he looked at 64 families. He was practicing at the University of Iowa, okay, so not, not not far from here, and he he described Fuchs as clearly being familial. Mm-hmm. Uh, but despite his his study, there were not lots and lots of follow-up studies looking at the inheritance patterns. Uh, we still thought there was there was uh, uh, spontaneous Fuchs, so Fuchs dystrophy where neither pa- neither family neither parent had had the condition or had a genetic defect, uh, which I personally th- think would is probably extremely rare. Uh, but there really wasn't much looking at the genetics and looking at the, the inheritance patterns for many, many years. I, I don't have a reason why, it just didn't. Uh, but here in Minnesota, because we have a you know, very strong Scandinavian population, uh, we really had the opportunity to study these patients. And the Fuchs is most common in Scandinavia, it becomes less common as you go further south in Europe. If you look at uh, Asia, India, Africa, China, it's much less common there. Mm-hmm. So we really have the opportunity to study a lot of patients because of the demographics of, of Minnesota. That's true. It's right place, right mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. It was meant for you in your career. Mm-hmm. So that your study published what, in, New, in the New England Journal of Medicine at some point, 2010, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. And that was the outcome of this serendipitous event right. that looked at the genetic correlations. Mm-hmm. What? How has that changed your career and and, well, just and a research small publication. Yeah, exactly. it's just, just New England Journal. But yeah. that was no a, big it, deal. That's a landmark <laughs> piece. How has that changed when you look back over the last ten years about your ongoing oh. research investigations? Because obviously that was one mm-hmm. study. But tell us then how that's changed your your, sure. your management and care or yeah. just perspective on this disease. There are a lot of different levels to to, to look at. When you answer that question, one is on the research level, because that study got a lot of interest from other people, and all of a sudden people started looking at that gene. So, so it it changed the focus. What does that gene do? Uh, how might it be causing Fuchs? So it really started a completely new avenue of research uh, here and and in other other countries as well as uh, the U.S. On a personal level, it had it helped to find my research career, but I also felt like a charlatan because I was publishing uh, an article on genetics when I knew very little about it. So everything in that in that article, uh, the, the parts that I wrote, I had to teach myself the science behind it. And Al Edwards, of course, you know, contributed, so, so he, he, he did the heavy lifting on that article. Um, it's also taught me to have humility for what you're doing because uh, I really started from a, a point of very little knowledge and had to teach myself. And looking back at how little I knew when we were in the middle of doing this research and publishing really you know, made me, you know, makes me humble. Uh, and even now, I, I think I'm, it should be very humble. My amount of knowledge on this, in this field, in the genetics, is still very small compared to what we'll know in five years or 10 years. So it's really taught me humility as a researcher. You know, we, we sit here in an academic institution okay. celebrating the lifelong learning we all get to have as we research and mm-hmm. teach and research and teach and continue to advance a field. And part of being in academic medicine is that humility over, there's a lot I don't know and there's a lot I want to know. But I think your example mm-hmm. is wonderful on how this is an area that you, in your career, found an opportunity and expanded your knowledge. And the more you learn, the more you realize, I don't know. Um, exactly. I would exactly. say for all of us, I think genetics is just this new frontier that keeps all of us mm-hmm. humble and is changing paradigms in terms of our, you know, our, our phenotypes mm-hmm. of what we see in the clinic. But what a wonderful thing it is that you've testified how you, you saw this opportunity, you dove into it, and how it just with time and onward hunger and, and investigation, you've become an expert in this niche. Exactly. And also I surrounded myself with people who are better than I am in the areas that I have less knowledge. 
Uh, the Al Edwards was no longer at Mayo, so he got started on this project. Uh, but after he left Mayo, I was I had a, a GWAS, that GWAS data. I had a gene, but what do you do with that? Right. So I just knocked on a couple of doors, and I knocked on the, the, the right door, which is Eric Wieben, who is uh, one of the senior individuals in our in our genomics area. And he looked at my paper, and it, it took a couple of knocks on the door to get him to, to get his attention. The first time, uh, I didn't get his full attention, but eventually I met with him, put the paper on his desk, and, and that, that got his attention. He went home for the weekend, and he came back and said, there's a genetic defect in TCF4 looking for a disease. So there's something going on in this gene. It should be cause, causing a disease. It should be pathogenic, but there's no associated disease with it. And that's the repeat expansion in the transcription factor for a gene. Repeat expansion is when you have nucleotides that repeat abnormally. And in Fuchs, it's a CTG trinucleotide repeat. And this, it's actually intronic, so it's not in part of the gene that codes for a protein. It's an intronic, which is non-coding part of the gene. But the CTG repeat in Norm, most patients, they'll have a dozen, 20, 30 repeats. But in Fuchs, there are at least 50 or 60 in the blood. But there may be thousands of these repeats in, in the cornea. Oh, wow. And the interesting thing is it's not a static mutation. This mutation can change over time within the cell. And the reason for that is too, too complex to go into right now. But we may measure repeats in white blood cells of 70, 80, 100, and there may be 3,000 of these CTG repeats in the cornea. So how common is that in genetics? I, I don't think I was quite aware that different parts of your body would show a different number of repeats leading to different disease states depending on the tissue. Yeah. With, with repeat expansion, expansion disease, it, it is. Uh, and repeat expansions are unstable mutations. So your, your DNA can, can shorten or lengthen as, uh, as time goes on. So even in a sessile cell, a non-dividing cell, like the brain, like cornea endothelium, that repeat expansion can actually lengthen. Uh, there's a whole set of, of DNA repair mechanisms continually going on to, re to repair your DNA during your life. And these long repeat expansions tend to gum up the system in lots of ways lots of ways, and one of those ways is it can allow the, the repeat to, to lengthen. We don't have exact, we don't have any knowledge of why the cornea, uh, as opposed to other, other parts of the body, uh, why is the cornea the only thing that's affected in Fuchs dystrophy, as far as we know, mm -hmm. uh, and the, I wanna underline it, as far as we know. Uh, and, and that's a great, you know, a great, great question to, to ask, and that's something we're looking into. But we do know uh, similar things can happen with other repeat expansion diseases. The one that most closely mirrors Fuchs dystrophy is myotonic dystrophy type 1. It's a similar CTG repeat expansion. Uh, it's, in a, it's not in a, a, a coding portion of, of the gene. Uh, and also with that condition, there are differences in the expansion length in the brain as opposed to white blood cells or, or elsewhere. But there are a lot of similar similarities with, with, between the two the two mm. conditions. Huntington disease is another repeat expansion disease. Uh, spinal cerebellar ataxias, some of those. And the next one is uh, a repeat associated form of ALS. Okay, so I, I'm curious on how your research has translated then over to your clinical practice. You know, what types of novel therapies or approaches or, or has there mm. been, has it made you look into or be curious about or, or consider to help an individual patient? Well, of course, the ultimate goal for the research is to come up with a cure, or at least come up with something that, that prevents the disease from progressing. There's a lot of interest now in, in the research community, in biopharma. Uh, there are some clinical studies that are going on now. Others are being planned. A lot of medications in the, in the pipeline to actually target this genetic defect to either splice it out and edit it using CRISPR-like techniques mm -hmm. or to silence the gene using a variety of other techniques. So as far as, as preventing the disease, I don't say there's really anything in the clinic yet, but we may not be far off. However, because of, of my interest, I've seen all of these patients with Fuchs, so, so you know, we, we just 
over the years, um, I've seen thousands, really thousands. And we have blood samples on thousands. We have tissue samples on, on hundreds and hundreds. So I've really, really just paid a lot of attention to what I see. And one of the things that we've been working on, I have Sanjay Patel really to, uh, uh, yeah, he's done really the, most of the work on that, is imaging, imaging using Scheinplug photography, Scheinplug imaging. And that's become an important part of the clinical evaluation, at least at Mayo, uh, in how we evaluate these patients. Uh, other treatment, I can't say our research has directly led to other treatments, although I'm confident that, that it will. Uh, but there are definitely other things that that are, are coming down the pipeline, other um, really, really interesting surgical techniques, uh, eye banking techniques. You know, if I look back at my career, uh, there's almost nothing I'm doing now that I was doing 30 years ago. And cornea transplantation is, is one of those things. You know, right now for Fuchs dystrophy, the gold standard, at least I believe the gold standard is decimate membrane endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, other people are also uh, looking at uh, decimate membrane stripping without keratoplasty, mm -hmm. just allowing the peripheral endothelium to repopulate. Uh, but these surgical techniques are, are light years from what we were doing 20 years ago with penetrating keratoplasty. It's mm -hmm. a quicker procedure, it's less risk, the patient gets better vision, uh, quicker healing. And now we're doing surgery you know, sometimes just a few weeks or a m couple months apart, which we'd never have thought of doing when patients had penetrating keratoplasty and you're dealing with sutures and you know, a million diopters of astigmatism. We just don't see those issues anymore. But I think the future, though, of transplantation may be cell-based. Right now, uh, one donor, one patient. And the challenge is there are people all over the world who need corneas and can't, cannot access them. There's a very uh, well-known article, highly quoted article, that, that calculated that only one out of 70 patients worldwide who needs a cornea transplant can actually access it. Mm. And wow. most of those, of those are in uh, underdeveloped countries, most of those patients who need, who need penetrating keratoplasty, but they just can't access it. And looking at the really big picture of, of what we're doing now, if we could culture endothelial cells for transplantation and take one donor and potentially turn it into enough cultured tissue, cultured cells for 100 donors, then that would free up 99 other corneas that we could send overseas. So I think looking at the really big picture is the future of corneal transplantation hopefully will make corneas more readily available worldwide. So what is cell-based therapy? Cell-based therapy is culturing your cornea tissue and culturing the endothelium and injecting those cells into the, into the eye. Uh, those clinical trials are happening right, right now. Some of this work was developed in, in Japan. Uh, some, some great researchers who had some, some wonderful ideas on, on how to do this. And there, there are clinical trials uh, that are taking place right, right now. Uh, and it's fairly, well, relatively simple. You know, strip off decimate membrane, or maybe not even strip off decimate membrane, inject some cells, and those cells will repopulate the cornea, cornea the endothelium. Now, granted, these are in early, you know, very early phase studies, right. but I think that's going to be the future. Now, well, taking that one step further, how about autologous tissue? How about taking some cells from somewhere else in your body, some stem cells? and engineering those cells into corneal endothelial cells and then injecting those cells into your eyes. So it's your own cells. Uh, there are a few steps to be, to be worked out there. Uh, it's an incredibly expensive technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't simply just take your stem cells and you know, put them through a series of you know, test tubes or reactions and spin them back into your eye. Uh, engineering stem cells is extremely expensive. Uh, process, uh, especially if you're going to do it for patients, FDA approved, et cetera. Uh, but, but the technology, the, the basics are there and people are working on this. So it's, it is doable. I think the doors that have been opened from yes. from all of this, mm -hmm. like you said, in the past 20 years, it's unbelievable how it far is. it's come just looking at Fuchs specifically as a little microcosm mm -hmm. of how far we can go 
in terms of translational mm. research. It's really incredible. I want to ask another kind of big picture question. Thinking about the comprehensive ophthalmologist, the cataract surgeon, what are your best recommendations for them to manage Fuchs clinically? Like talk about some imaging stuff for, for mm. evaluating progression. And then even with uncomplicated cataract surgery, what should we be thinking about as a comprehensive ophthalmologist? Right. Uh, I think there's nothing better than your clinical exam. Uh, getting a really good look with high magnification at that endothelial cell layer. I rely very heavily on a slit lamp that has high magnification modes. You know, many of our slit lamps have two magnification levels, and I can't see what I need to see with some of those, those devices. I really rely on, on high magnification. And with high magnification, using specular reflection techniques in most patients, I can see the cells. Or if they have confluent gutte, you don't see the cells. But I really, really rely on my clinical exam to, to determine whether this, when a patient has gutte, whether there's any endothelial reserve. Because if your clinical exam is good enough, you should be able to identify cells between the gutte. Or if there's nothing but gutte and, and no cells. So your clinical exam, I'd say if you're gonna do a lot of cataract surgery patients with the Fuchs, work on that clinical exam, number one. Number two, as I mentioned before, really excited about uh, shine fluke imaging. And, and again, you know, kudos to, to Sanjay Patel and, and uh, the team that he's, he's worked with to bring this technology to, you know, to everyday day clinical use. Uh, it does require special imaging. You know, we have a Pentacam device. Uh, but with the Pedicam device, we're looking for some very specific tomographic features. We're looking for, uh, for thickening of the cornea that has a certain pattern. We're looking at the posterior contour map. We're looking for depression in the central part of the cornea where the central part of the cornea de- bulges into the anterior chamber. Right, because there are other findings, mm-hmm. not just central corneal thickness. I mean, that's what that's what exactly. I think about when I'm thinking about Fuchs. I think central corneal thickness. Mm-hmm. But so you, there's other findings that are even mm-hmm. more specific to predicting progression. Yes, I, I think it, what we're finding is more of a tomographic pattern. And, and, and tomography is is basically the thickness and shape and, yeah. and volume of the whole cornea. But it's the, it's a certain pattern rather than just the thickness. Uh, there's some uh, and a nice study. Uh, that it was done that looked at uh, patients with Fuchs going going ahead and having surgery versus their unaffected unaffected relatives. Mm. And it was really interesting because the amount of overlap between normal patients and patients who have Fuchs as far as central corneal thickness, that overlap is huge, is mm. huge. So central corneal thickness alone really doesn't distinguish right. uh, the two groups whatsoever. We'll see patients who have perfectly normal corneas, perfectly healthy, with a thickness of uh, approaching 700 microns. Mm. And I've transplanted patients for Fuchs who have corneal thicknesses, central thicknesses, a low 500s. Mm-hmm. So the thickness itself doesn't tell you a whole lot. Yeah, it raises your index of suspicion, uh, but it does not replace your clinical exam. And I don't. I think it pales in comparison to to shine fluke imaging in the tomographic patterns. When we see that specific tomographic pattern, we also correlate that with a patient who is likely to progress mm-hmm. or likely to develop edema after cataract, cataract surgery, surgery or likely to have symptoms related to, to the cornea. So we see that tomographic pattern that's for us has become kind of that, that cutoff between when that, we decide that patient needs a transplant as opposed to can you get away with cataract surgery alone. Mm. That's that's very helpful because I think the comprehensive ophthalmologist that's a that would be a big question you know do they need a transplant or can I just do cataract surgery? Mm-hmm. You know, imagine what practice was like years ago before we had OCT to the right. macula. I think ten years from now we'll say can you imagine those days before we had shine fluke imaging or another imaging modality uh, to to look at the cornea? Yeah. So I'm curious in the evolution of management of cataracts in the setting of a, a Fuchs patient. Historically, I remember when I was trained quite a while ago that there was, you use the clinical tools to decide whether you could do a cataract surgery safely and not deal and let the cornea be the cornea, disease as it was, or whether you needed a triple procedure with a full thickness corneal graft. 
Now that the corneal transplants have changed and we don't do full thickness graft for Fuchs as much anymore, mm-hmm. has the um, decision point in which you do only cataract surgery changed at all? Mm-hmm. That's, that's a great question. Uh, I would say the decision point probably has changed. I think the threshold for doing a transplant definitely has changed. Uh, in the old days, and I gotta be careful how I use the term old days because I was practicing in those <laughs> old days, uh, to do a transplant, a full thickness transplant in a patient that's 20, 25, or 20, even 20, 20, visual acuity with early corneal edema was heresy. You just don't do that. Uh, but these days, if the patient has tomographic edema or clinical edema, what we mentioned the visual acuity chart and high contrast acuity is relatively less important. Uh, but also one aspect of that as well, since transplants are easier to do now, they're, um, you know, the outcomes are, are better, are surgeons more cavalier operating sure, on these exactly. patients? And I don't, I wouldn't say so, okay. because it's still pretty uncommon to see patients who have Fuchs and have cataract surgery and have decompensation. Yes, of course it happens, but I'm not seeing it as, a, as an op, something that's becoming more common. I think the cataract surgeons out there are so good and so facile and take all the steps to protect the, the cornea. Um, I don't think that they're being, they're being cavalier because they've got the tools in their toolbox to be really careful and, r- and really good surgeons. And I actually I think it's kind of surprising the patients with Fuchs dystrophy who have cataracts who can undergo cataract surgery without the cornea getting much worse. I, I would actually think it would be a more common problem. And I'm kind of surprised some of the situations I see in my patients and other doctors' patients where the cornea looks basically the same after surgery as it did, did before. Wonderful. Um, part of that's the resilience of the cornea. Yeah. But a lot of that is, is our, our, our really nice surgical techniques for cataract surgery. Well, that's very encouraging. Uh, this has been mm. absolutely outstanding. I've learned so much. We will link in the show notes links to uh, several of your papers. Definitely, mm. of, of course, your New England Journal paper, um, a few other genetics papers, and then the, Sh- the Schleimfeld. Um, Schle- I can't do <laughs> Schleimflug. <laughs> Schleimflug. <laughs> Moculoplastics. I can't say that word. Uh, imaging paper as well, because I think that that's actually really mm. high yield. So we'll link all those in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Barris. It was just wonderful. I agree. Well, well, it's been certainly. Nice. It's been insightful not even just about Fuchs disease but just even your story and how um, at any stages of our career the hunger for continuing to learn and the ability to do so and contribute in new ways was wonderfully shared so appreciate yeah. your, your yeah. being here well, well, th- thanks for letting me talk about this so it's like I said my favorite topic but also you know have that perspective of, of decades and uh, you know, everyone says you, you need to know when to say no but more importantly you need to know when to say yes yeah. and when to take advantage of an opportunity well, uh, well surround said. yourself with good people don't be a weak you know yeah. the weak link in your chain and and uh you know pursue something with gusto well said and well shared thank you for being okay. here with us on our podcast thank you thanks this has been great you can find all episodes of the mayo clinic ophthalmology podcast on our website thank you for listening and we definitely look forward to sharing more 